All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Fernando Nikolic. He is the Marketing and Communications Director at Blockstream. He's also the founder of the media research firm Bitcoin Perception, where he tracks and analyzes the mainstream media's coverage of Bitcoin. His other Bitcoin-related side projects include knowyourbitcoinmeme.com and bitcoinerbooks.com. I love talking to a fellow builder in this space. So uh, yeah, man, welcome, Fernando. Hey, how's it going, Bram? Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, like I just said off mic, I love that you're you're building products in this space. And I think uh, the first two were a bit smaller, but uh, Bitcoin perception is, uh, is really growing and I think it's really cool. So definitely I uh, want to talk about that. But first question, why is the price going down? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. Yeah, uh, I, I saw. Cheap, I saw cheap sats for everybody, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cheap, <laughs> cheap sats for everybody. Let the let the coins be distributed. Uh, let have more people get their hands on some, some fresh, uh, freshly sold uh, sats. Yeah, that's, that's all that matters, right? Hundred percent. No, it's just I was just half kidding. I think it's just so funny. Like everyone has like. Um, a thought about it or an opinion or something right but uh, i saw one tweet i don't know who, who shared it but like in the last bull run like on the way up it's like plus 20 minus 15 plus 40 minus 20 you know like it's it's just part of it but i think it's funny that well i still feel it i don't know about you but like i still feel it a little a little bit i'm not panicking or doing anything i'm still seeing on my hands but you know you still feel it i think it's interesting like for me what i'm kind of using now i I don't know if it was Sailor who said that, but for me, the the price is just uh, a representation of the understanding of the people holding it, right? So it's either people selling it, you know, they don't understand it, or if you gamble with it, long, short, whatever, you also don't understand it, right? It's uh, yeah. I used to be I used to be of the uh, of the understanding or the belief that okay, Bitcoin is this like decentralized thing where everybody uh, around the globe has access to it 24 seven. And therefore uh, the price is a, is a signal of like where we are in the adoption phase. And, you know, this is like the free market talking, but dude, it's, it's manipulated like crazy too. So it's like uh, all these like um, quick corrections or these like crazy jumps up is, is, is leverage that, you know, that gets squeezed uh, either, either uh, squeezed down or squeezed up. So, you know, at this point, I, I feel like, yeah, there's some manipulation, some some uh, people who recently got in who don't know what they're what they bought and they, they try to get rid of it like everybody else and panic uh, like everybody else. But I don't know. To me, all these corrections are just an opportunity to buy a little bit more cheaper than before. And um, yeah, uh, you get desensitized over time. It's kind of like seeing like, I don't know, uh, certain stuff on the Internet that's shocking. You get shot mm-hmm. like in the beginning, uh, like a lot, and then over time you keep seeing it. You kind of like, say, oh, okay, you know, and that's kind of like where I'm at now after a lot of years in this. Like, yeah, twenty percent correction is like, mm, okay, just yeah. another day in Bitcoin, you know. Do you have the same feeling when it goes up? Like, when does it, goes it feel up, real for you? Uh, it's, it's just yeah, no, I don't know. Like in my mind, you know, like I have a, I have a, a specific thing uh, that I want to do uh, when it hits a certain point. And until it hits that point, it's like whatever. Like um, just trying to live my life and not stare at screens all the time. All the time. So, you know, um, just trying to stay off the monitors for the most part. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, for me, my my psychological um, price is a hundred k. I don't mm-hmm. know. It's been that for a very long time. And m- maybe when it hits a hundred k, I'll be like, okay, now I know it's a real thing or something. I don't know. Like it's, it still feels, uh, sometimes it feels very abstract. Sometimes it feels very real. And I I have to think about, uh, I once met this pro, uh, like online, well, not, yeah, I think it was pro, like an online poker player guy. And he, he made millions, but he also lost millions. And at one point he said like, yeah, it was just numbers. (laughs) It it was just numbers. It didn't represent anything for him, but I always felt like I don't want to end there. Because I do feel, you know, Bitcoin is a huge thing and it can improve, you know, all, all of our lives. But it's just, uh, yeah, I, I think that the abstraction of the price is just, it's just a really interesting thing. But yeah, so you've been in Bitcoin for a long time. How how did your journey go? How did it start? Yeah, well, you know, um, I'm from Argentina, so, and, and I, 
you know, my family emigrated from Argentina when I was a kid. So I, I grew up between uh, Argentina and Norway and um, looking every time I got, I went back to Argentina uh, to visit the rest of my family. I was always like uh, in disarray because I saw that things in Argentina was just getting worse and everybody was talking about inflation, inflation, this inflation, that, and I didn't really understand what that meant, but I heard it so many times that I realized, okay, this is a real concern um, that people has. So um, when I, when I, you know, started college and stuff like that, I started just looking into it because I, I feel like I felt like I didn't really understand the concept of inflation based on my public school education. So I started grabbing some books and started to gravitate like slowly towards, you know, the explanation of inflation and the boom and bust cycles from like the usual Austrian, um, economics authors. Right. And, uh, once I understood that, I, you know, understood other concepts as well, like, you know, scarcity and, and stuff like that. And then, uh, when I, when a friend came to me, uh, back in early 2017 uh, and talked about Bitcoin, but that time I had uh, gone through some life experiences and also, uh, read enough. Uh, to understand the, the value of Bitcoin from that perspective, from the scarcity perspective, from, you know, um, the, uh, I don't know, predictable issuance uh, perspective, um, you know, against the total train wreck that is, that was, well, still is Argentina in terms of like money printing and stuff like that. So that's yeah. how I got in and started getting, you know, paid for like some freelance services uh, in Bitcoin. Uh, back then, I kind of like, I sometimes like uh, look for those uh, Coinbase uh, yeah, yeah, emails yeah, yeah. No, just to see that. like, fuck, man. <laughs> just, yeah. and, and, hey, man, I, I was I was a poor freelancer just trying to cover rent, man. But oof, that that's a expensive rent mm -hmm. uh, uh, looking back. But yeah, uh, that and then, you know, slowly, slowly, you know, accumulating what I could. Um, and I I think I needed, you know, looking back, of course, um, I needed the, the 2018 bear market to, to happen because that's where I kind of like started to see more signal from other people mm -hmm. um, because, you know, during 2017 leading up to the, to the bull run at the end of the year, there was just so much hype, so much ICOs, so much, so much crap out there. Yeah. And 2018, 2019, up until 2020, I was just like reading, uh, consuming a lot of content, listening to a lot of podcasts. Podcasts are, are important. There's some haters out there on Twitter that say that, that says that we don't need uh, podcast, but definitely we need podcasts. I needed a podcast in that in that phase, and then yeah, started working at Blockstream in 2021 when you know I had this goal of like working in in the Bitcoin in the Bitcoin industry after these years of like studying for myself and driving all my friends and family crazy, basically. <laughs> that sounds familiar. So what? <laughs> so so you are you confident enough to say you 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 got it when you found it, like? It clicked for you immediately. You mean at the price that I deserved? <laughs> no, I mean more like most most people when they encounter it, you know, like they dismiss it or they only get it a little. Mm. Uh, yeah, I shared this a lot before, but I, I, I found it in 2013, you know, and it's up and down your understanding, mm. you know, and I bought it 400, sold it 4,000, thought it was cool, but, you know, <laughs> and now I don't. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But, so I... And when I read old tweets, like from 2013, like I was talking about digital synthetic commodities, stuff like that. So I'm like, I got it, but I didn't get it, you know? So I was wondering, how, how about you? Because you had that background of not only experiencing what inflation does, but you did the work. You had, you had some background with regard to, you know, scarcity, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I think, you know, looking back to the fact that I traded all the Bitcoin that I got in order to, you know, trade it into cash in order to pay my rent. I guess I didn't really understand it that well, because if I <laughs> really did understand, I would have just kept it and find some other source uh, yeah. of revenue to, to cover that rent. Um, but at that time, paying for my rent had more value than keeping the Bitcoin, right? So it's all always this like, yeah, just sure. the dynamic of the different needs that you have. And I think, you know, a lot of people right now that don't have that extra money that do get paid in Bitcoin, like let's say like a remote worker in Brazil that gets paid in Bitcoin for graphic design work from somebody else. Well, maybe they do understand the, the, the value of Bitcoin if you hodl it, but they got bills to pay. So it's just the, that instrument you used it, you use it for whatever use case at the moment. So I guess I yeah. understood it for that thing, for that reason. But yeah, looking back, I should have just hodled it. <laughs> Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? 
gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature fold for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally. Only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet that's easy to use. With their mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a microSD card and is built with 100% open source software and hardware. You can get $10 off a Foundation Passport with code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. So what is your, what's your favorite like mental model or way of explaining Bitcoin to, to people who just find it? I don't think there's like one mental model to use uh, for everyone. Um, I, wrote a, I wrote an opinion piece about this uh, in Bitcoin Magazine, I think last year now. Um, mm -hmm. Basically saying Bitcoin is not for everyone, right? So, mm. and with and with that, I mean, uh, you can't you can't necessarily convince the entire world about Bitcoin using the same arguments that work with you. So, uh, you, you you could find a mental model that is so so you have a easier way to explain something complex in a simple way for, for yourself yeah. when you when you try to when you try to explain Bitcoin. But I think ultimately, you just need to find out what is whoever you're trying to quote unquote orange pill. You need to you need to do the work and uh, do some preliminary questions like what just to to understand what this person cares about, what are the biggest fears, uh, what are they trying to do in their life at this moment, what's their future plan, stuff like that, and then you can uh, take the angle that you feel makes more sense so so it resonates with that person because I mean there's a lot of people who who come to Bitcoin that are new and ask about Bitcoin and people say stuff like, oh, just go and read the white paper and then uh, ask me anything later. Mm -hmm. So that's just not going to happen. Like not, just one out of 50 will actually, well, first of all, take the time to read the white paper. Second of all, read the whole thing. Third of all, understand enough to actually have follow-up questions. Yeah. For, 49 out of 50 are just going to maybe read the first paragraph, understand that they don't understand anything, and then just like be too 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 afraid or too shy to, to ask anything else. So know who you're talking with and then try to find out some important things and then try to, you know, create the, the narrative from, from that end and not try to find like one thing that try to, you know, fit, fit all. Yeah. Yeah, I really try to change from explaining to asking questions because I agree I think um, I don't know about you but I cannot retrace my steps you know like how, what my thinking was and how I ended up here so <laughs> in, in that sense I wouldn't know what actually triggered me I think the main thing is uh, you know I realized that I uh, I was saving monetary energy in a system that I did not understand and I found a system that I did under, under, uh, did understood and so then I was like, okay, I'm going to move this energy from this, you know, fiat money system to, to the Bitcoin system because it just makes way more sense to me and it's way more transparent. But then again, I do realize like that, that works for how I am wired, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, right. And, and That's so, a pretty yeah. esoteric way of thinking what you just explained. It's not, it's not like the primer that you should maybe use, uh, you know? Apparently, yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's true. I'm really on this, um, how do you say? Yeah, like uh, my kind of visualization about it is is all around. You know, your your time and energy is scarce. You expend that; it's finite because once you expend it, you cannot get it back, right? Um, and then if you're rewarded in something that can be created infinitely, why would you uh, ever do that, right? That's kind of mm -hmm. then the starting point, and then talking about energy and blah blah. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah. No, definitely not not for everyone. 
but it's funny, right? Because you can have that like a conceptual explanation, or uh, I also tried, you know, explaining that, you know, once you understand that the money in the bank is not yours, that there's someone between you and what you think you own, and that you have to think about if you actually agree with that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so so then you kind of like try to more like trigger the autonomy of people, or you know, ho- however you want to call that. So yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's so diverse. It is, it is, and it's exciting, right? Because um, first of all, if you know, Bitcoin is decentralized in culture, not only in, in the technology. So it's like you have so many different people that believe in Bitcoin, that, but, but like different aspects of it. So you'll, you have all that, those people talking and, and you know, um, evangelizing Bitcoin in the way that they understand it the most. And they can be like super contradictory things as well, but it, it, it fits. Like I can, I can probably make a good case for Bitcoin for somebody on the far left politically and for somebody on the far right politically as well. So yeah. you have this like beautiful thing that where, where people that are like on paper, theor- theoretical enemies or whatever, they, they will still find a value prop uh, that, that makes sense for them. But uh, it is like a multi-touch point thing. And now I'm getting like crazy with the marketing jargon, but it is multi-touch. You need to just like, I agree. okay, go, go, go find that f- entry point that is as stupidly simple like totally left curve and then you just have to like drip drip feed uh, you know different things uh, and then see what what, what bites what does what yeah exactly yeah, yeah yeah and then it's just rabbit holes is is that that's the perfect way of explaining the whole thing uh, whoever invented you know wh- whoever used the term rabbit hole to explain this like the individual bitcoin journey is a genius because that is ultimately what it is you just need to just spend a lot of time um, a lot of time alone, actually, it's a very individual journey. Uh, and then you have these like little touch points where you have like an influencer here or a podcaster here or a book yes. that you read here and the mix of all of that, hopefully, and that is like, you know, maybe 50, 50 chance that it works, but hopefully that whole mix will make the brain go click. And then mm-hmm. you get, you got a, you got a new Bitcoiner for life, essentially. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. Bitcoiner for life. Like once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Yeah, it's so, exactly. so funny when we say these things, right? It sounds so uh, <laughs> sounds so shady, right? Like, yeah, what you see it, you don't know, whatever. Like, I think the funny thing is that people can verify for themselves, and uh, I think mm-hmm. also that's why it's hard, right? Because you don't know. I once learned the term "spiky point of view." I like that, mm-hmm. you know, like you you never know what what spike, you know, um, uh, triggers another person, right? It could be. You know, when you said left versus right, I thought about like I use apolitical a lot, a religious. You know, it's permissionless. Like all these things, all these things that you know people fight about in in like the physical world have no place in in Bitcoin. And for a lot of people, that sounds very strange. Um, but but I think like that could be one of those triggers. Like oh really? Like it's really neutral? Yeah, it's really neutral. Like it doesn't matter who runs which node or who runs which mining equipment right like that's the entire point the entire point is that it is neutral and then you know you just hope that other people ask questions i kind of have a little bit of a gripe with that when it comes to saying bitcoin is neutral or apolitical i don't think it really is because you know well just just to backtrack on on one thing that you said that i think is interesting is like you know the once you see it you cannot unsee it and that that thing is such a like a crazy emotional pull so Mm. it's a it's a you know, you're, you're, you're essentially, uh, you're taking the orange pill, right? So you see the world completely different. And I think, uh, one of the very like primal instincts or primal reactions when that happens is that, oh shit, I have understood a very deep concept and it's now my mission to like to tell the entire world about it. (laughs) Well, here we are. Yeah. 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 And then, and then you kind of like, you kind of like, okay, you use the same arguments that convinced you. And then you see, oh shit, it didn't work with that person. Okay. Let me try Mm -hmm. with this person. That didn't, didn't work neither. And then kind of, there's so many people that you you can even read it on Twitter. Like there's so many people who are given up on trying to explain Bitcoin because they, they hit, they hit their head against the wall so many times. And I think it's because they're basically using the same argument over mm-hmm. and over. And, and that's just like, again, back to my point of like, you need to know who you're talking to before you start talking about this esoteric thing that Bitcoin yeah. is. Good but but um, in terms of the neutral, the neutrality and the apolitical side of it, I mean, I guess, guess it depends on how you define apolitical. But to me, uh, 
separation of money from state is very political. <laughs> and um, okay, fair I, enough. I I think also I think aren't we as humans just political by nature? Like our the way we define culture, the way we express certain preferences, it's a political thing. I think humans we are political in our relationships. We are mm. political when it comes to if we, if you want to get a point across, you want to convince somebody about something, you think about it in a political way. Like, is this the right timing? Should I influence somebody else before I influence this person, et cetera, et cetera. And then ultimately, yeah, it is software, but there are people coding. There are people maintaining the, the these libraries in the background. These people have preferences. They, they, they in their mind, they all have a, some kind of an idea of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, so humans be are behind bitcoin essentially and if humans are essentially political beings i think it was like socrates or somebody who said that then bitcoin by default is 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 a reflection of the humans who are involved in it and therefore it is political too so yeah, i'm struggling with that bitcoin is a political phrase i think i think that's a very good point i think why i say that is maybe as an extension to kind of like bitcoin doesn't care like as it is just a protocol and it just runs right like uh that in that sense it's not influenced by politics but i agree you know when people are involved there's obviously politics because i, I think you said that great like politics is more about how how do i get something done right if i need another person how do i approach that right like just just thinking that is political, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but maybe there's two definitions of political. It's that approach, but but more like I think you know it's either left or right or something. But yes, separating money from state is a very good good point. Yeah, I guess it could be like I mean, a, yeah. could, it could be apolitical in the sense that it doesn't take any sides, right? like or it doesn't exactly. subscribe to a specific yeah. doesn't subscribe to a specific ideology. Yeah, like you have this like organized uh, ideology, the same way you have a, a organized religion. Mm -hmm. So you know, in terms of that, yeah, Bitcoin itself as a technology is neutral to those things. I'm just worried about the humans behind it, if you know what I mean. Because yeah, yeah, you know, I don't know if you follow, uh, you know the you know the, the the news, the the I don't know the the developers uh, in in the in the in the industry who who are trying to propose certain changes. I don't know if you follow like uh, not everything you know, the, these proposals, bit, yeah. but these are like political acts, right? Like you have somebody with a proposal, yeah, like censor certain uh, like censor ordinal stuff, or you mean like that? That that or or there's you know been people like Jeremy Rubin trying to get through to get CTV um, integrated into the into the base layer or the drive chains folks, the layer two labs folk mm. uh, trying to get the drive chain, uh, drive chain, the BIP 300 proposal too. All these people are just like, I think they're like politically campaigning for their solution. That's a good point. Need, yeah. Yeah. And they need to convince the people who are part of that, um, of, of that, of that decision. And I, I, I see them as political campaigns that they're really trying to influence uh, the same way a politician is trying to influence it to, to get your votes, you know? Yeah. That's a very good point. I'm thinking it's funny because I'm on a totally different track uh, with this. I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking, well, if you say like, uh, uh, if people are political anyway, right? If you mm -hmm. want to get something done, you have to convince someone, you know, that you have a good plan or that it's beneficial for them or whatever, right? Let's say if you need their vote or their help in some way. When I think about Bitcoin as apolitical, is that it takes that um, that money aspect, that like broken money, which creates broken incentives or perverse incentives aspect. I think I think uh, I'm kind of like on that uh, plane of thinking, you know, where that factor of broken money within politics between you know whoever people that want whatever uh, that that is neutralized. In a sense, yes. right, and so mm -hmm. that that it's actually more about okay, if I'm trying to influence you because I need your help, that it's actually more about the subject or the content or you know whatever the thing is that I want to eventually achieve. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of there. I, I don't know. I, yeah. I haven't I haven't fully formulated <laughs> that thought, but somewhere no, there. But it's it's a little bit like going back to you know the um, just old school capitalism, right? Like okay, if an idea is worth pursuing. 
uh, the uh, you should convince the market that your yes. product or service is superior to yeah. the alternatives, and the only yeah. way they can tell you that it is is by paying you for the services or the product. Yeah. Right. So you essentially that, and I think I agree with that. Like I haven't, I have never voted in my life. So, and I feel like the the best way to vote, quote unquote, is just to direct your the fruits of your time and energy, uh, a, aka your labor. Uh, put that into the things that you feel does something for you, and then yes. on the other side of the of that of that coin is the entrepreneur or the company or whatever who are doing this to you and thousands of other people, and as and and as a result, provides for society, right? Yeah, or yeah. not if you suck, right? <laughs> or no, if, but or, I think like, or if you sell yeah. cigarettes, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but but that's what I think is interesting when you. I, I think it's interesting you mentioned capitalism. Like, I wonder if we ever had like true capitalism in that sense with probably with, not with broken money, right? Because it's still. <laughs> I, I saw this clip. It was so interesting. It was Biden visiting. I don't know, like entrepreneurs or like SME, something, you know, uh, like a brick and mortar store type of people. And he asked this woman, like, how did it, uh, how's your business this year? And she's like, yeah, it's going great. I got a lot of grants from the government. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, right. you know, very funny. Very funny. And I was like, yeah, no, that's, that's not. That's not an answer to the question, but maybe yeah. that's the point, right? Like uh, a lot of people are angry at like capitalism, etc. But I just think like I don't think we've seen that much real competition, real capitalism. You know? Yeah, and it's also tough as well if you you know want to do something new. If you are a Bitcoin company, for example, you're you're essentially creating a product or a service that is part of a, a new paradigm, right? So mm. it's hard to. It's not like um. You know, you're you're starting a business of um, I don't know dishwashers, for example. Obviously, dishwashers is uh, established as an important product in society, so people understand the value. They don't need to be convinced. They all they all fight about the price or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin is like okay, you're 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 essentially building an industry uh, where 0.01 percent of the world's population is convinced about it. How the fuck do you scale that? So yeah. there's a lot of, you know, credit needs to be created. These companies need to get funded by venture capitalists. They need to borrow money uh, uh, to pay salaries and, and all the expenses in order to, you know, provide a, a product that has a, some kind of a product market fit, right? So yeah. I, I, I'm also a little bit against all this, like, okay, on a sound money standard, everybody who has something valuable will will survive. And, and if you don't survive, that means you're just... You, you, you don't provide anything valuable. I think there's a lot of new concepts and new products that reflects those new concepts that always gets created, or at least should be created if we live in a society that is always progressing, right? So you need some capital up front. You need, you need capital markets. You need debt. You need equity. You need, you need all of these things. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. a lot about that on a Bitcoin standard. How is that going to look like, right? It's, it's interesting. Well, don't you think that, uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I partially agree. I think people have to still try new stuff. They have to explore, they have to do daring new things that will probably fail because some, so, uh, un, until something works, 100% agree. I do think that, you know, if you look at the VC game in Silicon Valley, that's not all funding great ideas, right? And, and, and perhaps <laughs> that's also the result of the value of the money or how, yes you know uh vc funds attract their lps and you know how those lps make the money or how they value the money right so i'd say if you go to a harder standard of money you have to prove upfront way more about you know the 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 potential of your idea i would say and therefore you are inclined to do more work before you ask money from other people and therefore you have to better figure out if you can actually have that time and space to substantiate the idea more, right? So, I, in totally. that sense, I, I, so I don't disagree with you, but I think it 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 would make it more challenging for everyone to figure out what am I here to contribute, what whatever that is, right? So, if you think it's making bread, but your bread mm -hmm. sucks, then yeah, maybe you're not cut out to make bread, right? Which is yeah. which is fine, <laughs> again, right? So, I I, I I think then that if there are people that have like very, you know, world altering ideas that they are naturally more incentivized to to 
research that idea more before they get money because then it is also more viable perhaps than just you know kind of like spray and pray kind of VC <laughs> numbers game approach yeah no totally and and i think definitely that when when you are like a lot of these vcs are like closer to the to the spigot than the, exactly. the ordinary the ordinary yeah. man you know so they yeah. have that luxury to just like throw it around and see see whatever sticks and you know the the the, the playbook has been at least in silicon valley has been you know okay you know uh, one out of one out of 30 one out of 50 might make it yeah. Uh, and then the other, the other forty nine, they 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 can just go down. We can lose the money; it doesn't matter. But we need one unicorn that will kind of like pay back absolutely. But this, this the thought that I get from talking about this is, what is the worth of the money mm -hmm. if there are funds that, you know, for one hundred startups they maybe invest one, you know, a hundred times, let's say five million, right? Mm -hmm. So they put out fifty million. Sorry, five hundred million. And they expect the return to be two out of a hundred. Yeah. So yeah, how, yeah. what does that tell you about the value of that money? <laughs> you know, it's super interesting. <laughs> Funny. It's they they, they rather they they rather gamble that money away. Hundred uh, percent. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. You know, instead of keeping it and building something with that themselves or whatever. Yeah. But so yeah, for five hundred million, that's a good option. And yeah. That's just one fund. That's one fund. Maybe. Exactly. Exactly. And but but then you have you know like you. I think what you just said is also makes the case for like the, the, the solopreneur, the, the sovereign individual that learns how to build and has the right tools in place to do everything themselves. Like, I don't, okay, I'm not, I, I haven't even, you know, monetized Bitcoin perception. I'm just trying to build an audience and, and try to make mm -hmm. content and stuff like that. But I do everything myself. Yeah. And Blockstream, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff happening at Blockstream. So Blockstream definitely keeps me busy. I would never be able to do what I'm doing with Bitcoin Perception now if, for example, certain tools didn't exist. Yeah. If I couldn't automate a bunch of stuff, if I couldn't use AI for a bunch of stuff, I would just have I would have to quit Blockstream in order to uh, pursue Bitcoin Perception for free uh, for a year or two or however long until I see some kind of a product market fit or the audience tells me how to monetize it in the end. So it's definitely like, would you, would you, the way that you explain it, where you like, I don't think that necessarily companies will have the luxury to wait that long. Uh, not the ones that are super ambitious, at least, but solopreneurs. I, I like that name. Indie hackers, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Solopreneur. You know, those, those people, they have a bright ass future. And especially if you are in a country like Argentina or whatever, you're just like your laptop and your internet connection will give you crazy ROI. Uh, yeah. if you, if you are man, if you manage to find like a pain point that is very, very specific, very niche, uh, but that has a, you know, good enough audience that are willing to give you, I don't know, 10 bucks a month, uh, over lightning, something like that. Uh, I think those people will, will definitely thrive in the future. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent agree. I, uh, I wanted to, to refer back to something you, you said before about, you know, uh, trying to orange pill others, etc. I I would assume you are a millennial too. Yeah. So boomer boomer millennial, but but I'm I'm a millennial. You're like an early millennial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So how do you experience talking about Bitcoin with like our generational peers? How's that been going in in your real life? Do you still, you know, find uh, Bitcoin hooks in every conversation, or <laughs> you you care less? I care the less to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm not super excited about that. I, I I got other stuff. I got other shit to do. But um, I, even people coming to me asking about Bitcoin, I usually say, uh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm not even. I'm not even um, interested in orange building because I can see by the nature of their question that they're like in it for the quick mm -hmm. buck. Um, and I never want to, and I have done it before. I never want to give anyone investment mm -hmm. advice because, you know, I had a very good friend of mine who, uh, got in, in 2021, kind of like middle halfway middle, uh, in the bull run. And I told him like, you know, DCA do your thing. Um, this is a bull market right now. Things are crazy, but it might get corrected. And he, and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All good. All good, buddy. And then, um, you know, uh, when 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 things happened in 2022 and 2023, um, the relationship became different. You know, um, and 
later later on i found out that he kind of like didn't didn't follow any of my advice and just like aped in like a true dgen mm-hmm. uh, at 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 the pico top and then you know uh felt like shit afterwards so it's like yeah. you know you you can say certain things um it's another thing uh whether they're going to follow your advice or not so right now i'm i'm chilling man because i also feel like there you have you you become responsible for that person in a weird way you know, you become mm-hmm. that person that they always go, go to whenever uh, Bitcoin crashes or Bitcoin pumps or whatever. And I'm like, just here, here are some good resources. Read, ask me anything, but read. Um, yeah. That's kind of like my go-to right now. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything related to millennials or, or you know, what kind of demographic or age you, you belong to, to be honest. I, I, I've, I get stupid qu- questions from, from young people, I get smart uh, questions from older people. Um, I don't see any big difference in like cohorts. Yeah. Inter- interesting. Uh, me, me neither, by the way, I think in general, it's more about, are you, yeah, like you said, are you, are you curious enough or triggered enough to just study for yourself? Right. I, um, I, I think we all know that it takes a long time and that it takes these waves of understanding and conviction based on the understanding right not conviction based on whatever someone says to you i think that's a very important distinction to make totally um that yeah you 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 get it or you don't and then but the losses are also part of it right i mean you know having a friend who has big losses uh or well it's not lost until he's sell, but anyway right exactly uh, you know, just the perception of that. I think you know that is obviously not nice, but it is part of it. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, that, I, yeah, that's 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 just how it goes. I think the thing about millennials today is that I think it's I don't know, it's maybe the easiest on paper group to cater to because obviously they are priced out of the you know property market or whatever. Um, they have certain struggles at their age that their parents maybe didn't have. So there's a lot of stuff that's in their faces yeah. where you can say, Hey, you know, you are, you are suffering. You have a pain point here. You, do you know why? And do you know that there are other alternatives? Right. So on paper, in theory, the, the entry uh, should be, you know, the, the bar to entry should be lower. Um, but yeah, I mean, it all depends on the individual. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, yeah so it's it's very you can explain it in a rational way right but i think uh, there are a lot of like mental mental challenges that that people have is that something you recognize like what well, what do you think is like a big big mental hurdle that that people need to get over before they can like research or adopt bitcoin i i used to be i used to be of the thought that like if enough pain is in your life you will get it but mm-hmm. <laughs> um you know, years ago, like back in 2015, I like really connected with the with Argentinian culture and, and stuff like that. Because uh, as as an adult, my my parents they 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 all live in Europe. Um, most of my friends that I made also every, everybody has emigrated. So I, I know a few people that are still living in Argentina. Mm-hmm. Maybe you know the the contacts that I have through through working in Bitcoin are the only people that I that I know, and they understand Bitcoin obviously. So I don't really get the 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 the, the layman. Um, version but i was always of the thought like holy shit if argentina if argentinians see um i don't know 30 percent inflation per month surely they, they must go to other things like bitcoin and stuff like that and then exactly yeah that's I, my I, idea too yeah. and then one of the biggest ethereum communities is in argentina right and bitcoin really has uh kind of like struggled uh to get a foothold in argentina and you're like holy man like you yeah. guys need the Bitcoin the most. And well, they're sold on Ethereum. <laughs> so what can you do? Uh, certain certain people, they will go through lots of fire and still don't understand uh, a real solution when it's in front of them. Um, some people will go through really tough hardships. And instead of uh, going a self-sovereign direction, they just ask the government for help. Um, depends on a lot of things, but... Uh, I used to think like the main thing should be living in poverty, uh, having the middle class eradicated, having all your monies, all your salary, all your savings evaporated in inflation. But still, still people, humanity ha- or humans have this like 
crazy ability to adapt to any circumstances, no matter how hard it gets and just like, okay, go with the flow instead of changing direction. Yeah. Um, and yeah, for Argentina, that, that is definitely the case. A great example. I love to hear that as you know, someone who, who's actually uh, uh, from there, right? Because I have the same belief, like if you have the problem, th then you're going to look for a solution, right? Like that sounds so simple, but uh, I've experienced, but also, you know, heard from my guests that that's not always the case. And I, yeah, I find that fascinating, right? Like I, I think that shows for me, like the battle uh, that we're up against like this is how how deep that part of the rabbit hole goes goes right like that that even when you realize that there's like a third party that influences your life you're still like yeah okay <laughs> whatever <laughs> or something <laughs> like that right yeah that's 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 a, that's a wild thought that's a crazy and you have you have certain you have certain forces working against us as well right like let's be mm -hmm. completely clear there are like a huge organized media arm that are just writing lies about Bitcoin or like crazy misrepresentations of certain certain qualities and certain properties of Bitcoin. And they have um, they have uh, just repeated it and repeated it and repeated it like true propagandists. Mm -hmm. um, and that has definitely affected the way normal people um, think about Bitcoin when you when you go to them and say, hey, do you do you or do you accept Bitcoin? If you say that to a merchant, they will have a certain a certain yeah. like a negative knee-jerk reaction because there's a, there's big forces at hand that are fighting against what we're trying to convince people of. Um, so let's you know let's be realistic about that too. Yeah, yeah. No, that's what I mean. With that's that's an illustration of of how big that um, that battle is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I just think in general, why are you paying attention to uh, a random uh, internet forum idea? You know, <laughs> like, why why? You know, you're yeah. only paying attention because it deserves to get attention. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that's it. So um, yeah, let, we'll talk about it in a bit because I would love to hear about how how you've seen it evolve. But I wanted to ask you, like, how how has Bitcoin changed your worldview then? You've seen the inflation and the changes, and you adopted this. Yeah, yeah. It's just um, you know, I have been able to preserve my my purchasing power uh, for my savings. Like Bitcoin is my savings; it's not an investment. And the fact that I have not only been able to preserve it, but also grow it, uh, puts me in a very nice position where I can be so much more in control over my own life. Um, if I, for example, feel like uh, I want to I want to travel somewhere else and and set up shops somewhere else. I can do that. I have the freedom to do that. Uh, if I want to go on a sailboat for two years and not even think about what's going on on the internet or have any like work responsibilities, I can do that. Um, if I want to buy a house, I can do that. Um, stuff that I probably wouldn't be able to do if I if it wasn't for Bitcoin. Um, mm. And I think that it's 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 it's, it's like a zero to one thing, like. If you have that, then anything else, you can scale that infinitely to whatever you, that you want in your life. And the more you kind of like wait and you keep accumulating, I guess, and your purchasing power um, grows over time, the bigger opportunities will be, you know, in, 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 you know, part of your like options that you have available. So that is just a total game changer. And um, it has been able for me to look at life, you know, <laughs> In a chill way from that from that perspective in terms of in terms of like the philosophical aspects uh i i enjoy it a lot and i and i feel like you know i love to read i love to geek out on on different things and um um i have the philosophical thing was very very important in the beginning of my like bitcoin journey uh that changed changed you know um the way i i look at life uh in a very radical way i would say but now you know after you know 3 years at blockstream i'm looking at like the technical side of things as well and i'm very excited about like fucking these galaxy brains what they are what they're trying to do you know like and kind of, like how hard it is and um how challenging it is it, it, you know it's hard enough um to do what we're trying to do right now but we come a long way you know like we're 15 years deep in this thing and um you know, I look back and all the OGs that are still with us today and I'm like, shit, it's, 
they paved the way, man. Uh, we got a lot. We, we had to, you know, thank them a lot uh, still yeah. to this day. Um, so I'm, I'm looking back at the, the whole, like what we're trying to do here. And I'm just so excited for the future. I'm like so insanely excited for like the impact that we all are going to do as a collective. Not only the builders, but also people who are influencing the culture, who are moving the needle in terms of education and stuff like that. And it's just like, ah, oh, the future is so bright, man. It's, um, it's wonderful. Yeah. I love, I love that the common denominator is this positive outlook. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I think lots of people see that. What what was the the main like philosophical topic or 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 thing that stood out to you in in that in those like early early days that you got in? It's funny because for me the philosophical part came way later. I think that's more what I'm into now. Well, I think maybe the the, the best thing, and you know, later on I've been kind of like looking back at some of the stuff, and I'm like thinking shit, man, this a little bit. Uh, like a little bit too like mental masturbation going on here and we need oh, to yeah. ch chill out a little bit and <laughs> oh, let's fun. get no, real. I love, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the um, the biggest thing is this like how we are able to have a measuring stick into everything in life that we are able to um, communicate value to each other with something that is not elastic. That is, it's a ruler that is a hundred centimeters and that is it. Um, yeah. And that kind of like shit, that switched on a lot of different things for me because um, it's crazy. Like you go to, you go to buy some, like just to give you a stupid example, like you go and, and buy milk uh, at the grocery store in Argentina um, and this stuff gets, you know, 20% uh, more expensive. Um, it's not just getting more expensive. It's the, the money that you're buying the milk for that is getting less uh, valuable over time. And, uh, it just it just messes up your whole like it distorts your whole life you know mm. and uh, this this aspect of of like Bitcoin being this solid measuring stick really I, I really really like that I think that's that's a pretty like the one thing that's still sticks sticks out from all the esoteric uh, readings yeah love that you mentioned this I think this is my main uh, philosophical topic. The, just li literally this um yeah it's it's only comparable to uh, comparable to time so mm -hmm. when you spend your time to create value you should be rewarded with something that is equally valuable equally scarce right and and there's only one thing which is uh which is bitcoin so uh, yeah very cool that you that you that you gave this example um <laughs> before we dive into um Bitcoin perception. I wanted to ask you, what's your uh, what's your favorite Bitcoin meme? Shit, you, <laughs> you have to. You should have prepared me, man. I can't. I can't answer this like and be. I can't answer this on, on the spot and be happy with this answer. But, okay, um, damn. Okay. Oh man. Um, let me think about it. Like, uh, give me ten uh, okay. seconds. Let me see yeah, what we yeah, can yeah. get here. Go for it. Okay. Uh, Oh no, man! Uh, it's, it's actually more like um... <laughs> okay. This this is the one that I like. Okay. I like the um, I don't know if it's a Bitcoin meme necessarily, but it's this like triangle uh, of like um, uh, different different stages, like the white pill, the black pill, and all of that. And it's mm. just like everything is fucked up and it's bad, and then everything is fucked up and it's okay. Uh, everything is fucked up, but I can't do anything about it. So that's cool. And then on, on top is like the floating Zen Bitcoiner who is just like floating in this orange space and it's just above it all, you know, and just like totally Zen. Oh, I got it. It doesn't got matter. It. You found it? Yeah. So it doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter what happens in the world. As a Bitcoiner, you, you, you just, uh, you're above it all, you know? And uh, I think that's so, so true. Um, yeah, I think oh, that's, so that's the one that comes to mind first fire. and least. Ah, I got it. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. It's yeah, uh, yeah. Wait, wait, I'm gonna open it in my uh, screen. It's, it's um, yeah. I I cannot edit here in the screen because then uh, the recording is messed up. But uh, it's uh, if you know, you know. It, blue it, pill is things are okay. Red yeah. pill is things are not okay. Mm -hmm. Black pill is nothing is okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The white pill is nothing is okay, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. The clear pill, the the pinnacle is uh, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. Right? Yeah, and then yeah. you have like the orange pill. Yeah, it's like a floating Buddha guy. Yes. It's like fi fix the money, fix the world. 
Exactly. Yeah, funny. Exactly. Oh, I love that. I'm saving that up. I think though a lot of Bitcoiners are stuck in the black pill though. I think it's kind of like messed up. Like I, I feel like there's a big cohort. Mm. I don't know if it's a growing cohort, but I think it's it's big enough to talk about it. Of well, Bitcoiners. It may, maybe are, that, well, this is the phases you go through, right? That's a I Bitcoiner. Mean, yeah. I mean, um, I think it's funny because uh, when you are like in the blue pill, the things are okay. It's like you're very uh, individualistic, right? And then once you get less individualistic, you start to notice the other things, yeah. right? And so things are things are not okay. It's like, oh, yeah, other people have a pretty fucked up life and I'm very lucky, you know? And then the red pill is like, whoa. <laughs> and then, well, anyway... It, when you get to it is what it is, it's pretty individualistic again. It is. Right? It is. So, so you come back to yourself, but I feel, and this is a big word, right? But almost like Bitcoin is like the enlightenment above that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but <Let's> go, Bram. <laughs> yeah. But, and, and why is that? I think it's because I think, I think the main thing there is that everything in that pyramid, why everything is so fucked up, is because the money is literally so fucked up, right? The money corrupts the value exchanges between... Well, because the money is broken, it breaks the value exchange, the incentives in the value exchange, right? If I trade my finite time for something that can be created infinitely, I'm not incentivized to deliver my best value to you know ever be delivered at that moment in time as compared yes. to what we what we mentioned before is... If we have a hard money standard and capitalism, I have to try to make the best fucking bread ever. And if then I sell it to 10 people and they all hate it, you know, that's, you know, it, it's, it's hard, but it's real. It gives yeah. me very good information to move on to something where I maybe actually can, you know, add, add value. And that's, that's why I think the, and enlightenment is a big word, I know, but, uh, but I mean, like, that's where that comes in. It's like, Nothing actually matters. Everyone is figuring it out. I can do yes. whatever I want, right? And I am able to to try whatever I want because at least I'm not getting, you know, abused by a third party that's, you know, breaking the money that I'm using to, uh, you know, have all these little value exchanges <clears throat> with other people that are figuring out, you know, what the hell exactly. is going on. So, yeah. Exactly. I think it's also like um, you, you used the word enlightenment, but I... I think maybe I like enhancement or, or, or like an enhancer, kind of like how, you know, alcohol brings out <laughs> the real you. So, you know, you have, you have bad drunks and you have good drunks, you know, it's like if you are yeah. a bad, a bad person, you will be a bad drunk. And Bitcoin is like something, something similar. Like you, you do this like crazy introspection of yourself when you go through all the stages of uh, your Bitcoin journey. So what comes out on the other side is back to you being the, the, the the single individual, but you are now the your true your true self that you always had inside. I don't know because I, for example, um, I am a person. I, I think I'm, I'm a positive person. I, I look at everything very positively. I always like do these like mental checkups with myself, and I think, shit, how how would my life be if I was still in Argentina? How would my family will be still in Argentina? So I'm like I, I am super blessed, yeah. super yeah. privileged. Um, so I'm, I'm always trying to bring that energy into everything that I see. And when it comes to Bitcoin, uh, you don't even have to work in the industry necessarily. I'm again, very privileged because I work at a place like Blockstream and I have access to like crazy galaxy brains on a daily. Um, but I get super inspired by people who are building shit in Bitcoin right now, apart from Blockstream, everything, everybody like eCash, Fediments, you name it. Everything that is being built right now is super exciting, dude. And yeah. apart from the builders, just if you hang out, if you kind of like follow the right accounts, I would say you got to be like super, uh, you got to curate your content uh, pretty wisely, I say. But if you follow like what I consider like good people, good influencers, thought leaders in the space, man, you learn so much. So you're like, you're surrounded by like crazy intelligent people the smartest people that I've ever met have been, uh, you know, through Bitcoin. So how, how can you not be bullish on the future? Uh, you know, just based on those two things, the people, yeah. what they say, what they think and the stuff that they build, it's just like insanely bullish. So um, yeah, I guess that's, that's kind of like, I think part of like getting to the, 
to float above the pyramid is to just be conscious of these things. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, conscious as you says, but, uh, you said, but also just leave them be. Yeah. True. Like that, that, yeah. Like part of it is what it is. You know, it's just like you, you cannot change that. So you focus on one thing where you can, you can add value and of which you think that that could contribute to all the, all these other layers. Right. And, yeah, all, exactly. and all these other people. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, stop pointing fingers at people. Stop saying that they're idiots if they don't get Bitcoin at the first touch point. You know, stuff like that. And you just let let people be. They'll come to their senses or not. Doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Whoever whoever needs to be part of Bitcoin are part of Bitcoin right now. Hundred yeah. percent. So, w why do you think memes are so important in communicating about Bitcoin? <laughs> well, one thing that I think the ordinary Bitcoin are trying to convince other people about Bitcoin is trying to simplify complex things. And memes just cuts right through it so beautifully uh, that it's it's one of the most important tools that we have um, straight up. Yeah. I love how, how it's a challenge to condense uh, something in an image. Yeah. I am, I am very bad at uh, memes, but uh, I, lo I love how creative people are. It's insane. It's yeah. really, really insane. And they're funny. They're smart. They have a pulse on society. They have a pulse on what's happening right now. They know they they are they know about timing because it's in the end it's fucking comedy, right? So timing is just so such an important variable uh in this. Uh and they just put, make all of these combined so beautifully. And uh I think not only for Bitcoin, but just in just the world that we live in right now, I think we have so much information uh available. Uh, it's hard to navigate. So we need memes to just like make yeah. us laugh, make us understand something complex in a quick, uh, in a quick matter and gain an understanding. It's, it's education. It's, it's yeah. memes are education and a cultural driver straight up. I have to think of a meme. I just, I literally just saw like an hour before we recorded it was like, uh, of an IRS guy knocking on a door and he says, you have to open up like you have to pay 30 percent of your income and then you see like this little text bubble coming from behind the door it's like um why do i have to pay and then he and then the irs guy says to to protect you i'm from the government and then and then he says to protect me from what and then he says to protect you from whatever i'm doing if you don't pay the 30 <laughs> percent like, what the fuck it's so good so good yeah yeah it's beautiful yeah. it's interesting that's almost an entire study summarized in one image yeah like, because like, you know yeah because you know in a new in a perfect world some some normie sees that meme and it's, and it's like starts to think you know like yeah why? is it really why? like that why, what like, is why? that yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah funny so hopefully it can be like a trigger you know like yeah yeah and so how, how did you come up with the idea of start tracking like the perception of bitcoin in the media because i saw some stats i think it's really cool what you're doing now uh because you have coverage that goes back to october 2011 you have 79 outlets in the us uk eu latin america you even have country bias which is interesting and i think through the master inspired you to add like private versus state funded bias also very interesting like how how did you start this where did where did the idea come from Actually, I have something else that Tour de Meester uh, inspired me too, because we we got to we got to uh, to talk or over DM yesterday, and he he taught me uh, about uh, what is it called agenda setting theory, and um, <laughs> it's kind of like a, a a tactic that the media uses uh, to kind of like astroturf a certain topic. So it's mm -hmm. like, okay, at this point, we're going to talk about this thing in with, with this angle, and we're going to have like 400 articles in, in the next uh, two, three months oh, yeah. to kind of like steer the narrative and like we decide how this thing is going to be talked about by spreading all this. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like negative or, or positive. It doesn't have to be like FUD or hit pieces. It's just this is the angle, and yeah. we're going to run with this for, for a specific period of time. And uh, so I'm I'm looking at these things now and i saw one example already related to energy and the environment which is incredibly interesting and i yeah i think this is like a, a research report in itself so yeah thank you tour um and what made me start this uh well 
I work in communications, so I deal with you know stuff like um, press releases at Blockstream every time we have an announcement and we want to go to you know uh, Bloomberg or Fox or whatever uh, mainstream media outlets to uh, to talk about something. Uh, I deal with, with with the journalists. I I deal with the outlets. And I pitch to them, right? Uh, I figure out an angle. And then, you know, I do media training uh, internally as well for the blog streamers who will go on these interviews. So I, I think about these things a lot, basically, is what I'm trying to say. And um, in, 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 my, in my job, just straight up, I needed a tool that would give me a quick answer to, okay, which outlets uh, covers a specific topic? Like, what are they interested mm. in a specific topic? Good one. And then... How are they covering that topic? So they might be interested, but for the wrong reasons. So I shouldn't be. I shouldn't reach out to these journalists. Uh, or if there are specific journalists in a quote unquote hostile outlet that actually has an interesting point of view, and it could be it could be beneficial to maybe try to reach out to that journalist, establish a relationship, and maybe you know have Adam back uh, be interviewed. So yeah. um, I was looking around for these tools and then it didn't exist. So I, so I built it myself, basically. That's the that's the origin story. Nice. And and so how are you seeing it changing? Like, how mm. are you seeing the perception changing, if any? I think like looking at all these 79 outlets in all these countries as one, uh, yeah, you can, you will go to the dashboard on Bitcoin perception and be able to see some graph telling you something. But I think the true like trends lies a little bit de deeper in individual outlets, individual journalists, individual countries. Um, so that's kind of like what I'm, what I'm trying to see. Uh, obviously the first thing that I noticed that was like a general trend was that uh, when the ETF was about to be approved. So that happened in February, I think January, yeah. January. I already started to see in the Q in Q4 that, in general, like things were less negative uh, leading up to uh, to the ETF, so I was like, okay, they know something. Maybe we don't know because um, all of a sudden, a lot of uh, a lot of outlets who have historically been very anti Bitcoin now saw some neutral, balanced uh, articles uh, flourishing mm -hmm. up. So I was like, okay, they're bending the knee because <laughs> because they know. Uh, yeah. So that, that that was like the first thing, but then um, I'm always looking for trends. It's it's a lot of a lot of like um, uh, trends in different time frames uh, that that is very very interesting. And I just try to I just try to post about them on on Twitter whenever I see something interesting. But the ETF thing I think was a big big like narrative shift that yeah. a lot of outlets was part of. Not like individuals here and there, but like the whole entire mainstream media. They definitely yeah. shifted. I think it's super interesting that um, Forbes really got taken over by Bitcoiners. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what's going on there, but lots of uh, people who write about Bitcoin and very, very interesting. Uh, I think it's Decentra Suze who writes a lot about, um, you know, all the policies and stuff, what Dennis Porter is doing. I think uh, uh, great. that's a great angle in Bitcoin to also talk to a more general public i say if you mix it with you know the politics or the the let's say legal uh legal legal dimension but uh yeah super interesting uh, and I, I would recommend everyone to go to bitcoinperception.com because you can play around right with um you know the sentiment the times the outlets all these things um so it's really interesting to see like what what are people writing about also because you can click through to basically everything um yeah very cool so what you know you and i obviously think that this is the most important subject to research and uh, write about <laughs> but what what has following the the bitcoin perception taught you about the role and interest for the neutrality of the media in general well, first thing that I started thinking to myself as I was like cleaning up the data, looking at charts, playing around, building the dashboard and stuff like that was that I think Bitcoiners as an entity, which you should be very careful not to talk about Bitcoiners as one like monolith anyway, but still, let me do it now. Um, I think we all have had some PTSD or whatever from a lot of the FUD that, that has, you know, uh, 
that we've seen a lot of the bad headlines that we've seen a lot of the clickbaity stuff so we have kind of like over time developed this relationship with the msm as like everybody at who works at the msm is evil and uh we we shouldn't um we shouldn't uh yeah we should fight back no matter what um i think that was probably true back in like 2017 2018 but i think now you know as you know each cycle brings like mints new bitcoiners you know new bitcoiners come into the scene people discover bitcoin for the first time for every cycle i think for every cycle there's also a lot of journalists that are coming into the the scene and they start their journalism career for the first time now as well and they are covering bitcoin too and i think they're different i yeah. think they're they just have a more um natural curiosity to bitcoin they're not necessarily out there to to do a hit piece uh, every single time. Um, obviously, I'm not saying like there's no FUD right now. Of course there is. But I think it's important to be nuanced about this and see, hey, there's actually a cohort of journalists who are writing about a very specific thing within Bitcoin too. So they're specializing in themselves in, yeah. in specific topics. And they have a interesting, curious uh, take. If I go all the way back to 2011, 2012, the stuff that I see in there, it's amazing. Like the majority of outlets at that time were actually doing very interesting work. Like Al Jazeera, for example, in 2012 visited like a Chinese miner operation, took photos, stayed with them for like five days. What? Like really, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Really did a deep article and like, okay, how how is the the operation working? But kind of like talking about the the energy use and kind of like they're they're like the the impact on society, on Chinese society that like miners were starting to get at that time, right? Because that industry was growing like crazy back in 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of like interesting investigative journalism that happened in the very early stages of, of, um, of Bitcoin. And then in like 2017, a lot of negativity happens. And then now we're entering another cycle where there's like more specialized work. So I always use David Pan, who is a reporter at Bloomberg, as the main example. Like he writes about mining. Um, basically, ninety percent of his articles is about Bitcoin mining. And dude, he has so many interesting takes. So many, yeah. It's just he does great work. And then you have like Mackenzie Sigalos, which uh, I think a lot of Bitcoiners know at CNBC. She goes to like festivals. She goes to conferences. She like shakes hands with the plebs, and really is out there. On, on the streets, right? Like trying to get stories. Uh, yeah. So she's also like naturally curious, wanting to understand more. Um, so we need, as Bitcoiners, we need to be aware of these journalists who are still doing a great job. And I think if you are in a Bitcoin company, I think you should bring them closer. You should bring them into your like uh, world and tell them yeah. what you do. Um, we Because we need, we need journalism. Um, you know, journalism is, you know, the original concept, at least, is is, is a good thing to have. It, it has been corrupted by bad incentives, like everything else, like we talked about, right? Because of bad money. Yeah. But I think the actual work, the the craft, the art, people who write and who report, um, they play a big part in in adoption. So if we want to like take Bitcoin to you know the next billion or whatever, kind of hate that term. Uh, it's getting so cliche. But if we want to do that, we need to play along with um, with certain certain cohorts of the press. Yeah. Uh, another thing that's also maybe more important is also know who not to uh, bring close, uh, right? You need to know who are the ones that are that just write very negative things, who have a very personal uh, negative relationship with Bitcoin. There's a lot of reporters who do. They will just never see the light. They will never change their mind on anything. So it, it's good to kind of like track them as well, right? And see who they are. And they also shift. They work for different outlets as well. So you can follow the same person writing for mm -hmm. Reuters and Bloomberg and then CNBC. And, yeah. you know, you, you should be able to be, be, be to have access to that type of uh, information. So. Um, yeah, that's why that's why I built it. A big conversation. Yeah, so super interesting. I said be before we started recording, I love that you are one of the few people I think who's going to have the receipts later, <laughs> right? Uh, and I, I think it's great. I think it's a brilliant idea, and also uh, something that is um, 
I think it's valuable for a lot of people, actually. And I love your approach of just building, adding value. And then, you know, if you would want to monetize later, of course, uh, you know, I I always think that's possible if you know you deliver value, you know. But for now, um, yeah, I think it's a great research tool. So again, um, I'd love to invite everyone to to check it out. But like, what, what is it about Bitcoin that invites people who adopt it to also contribute it? Like where where does that calling come from? You think? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's kind of like mm, when you are convinced about Bitcoin in the beginning, like we like we uh, talked about earlier. I think your instinct is just to like shout from the rooftop, you know, like go up top of a mountain and just like scream to the world uh, about it. And I think if you if your version of uh, screaming that into the to to the world is through a podcast, okay, create a podcast, man. You know, um, or if you are technically inclined, like if you're like some kind of a, I don't know, if you're like a German cryptographer who was like interested in cryptography in general and then discovers Bitcoin, hey, you know, and, and you get that same urge of like, you want to contribute, then okay, uh, start building something or uh, do some research or, uh, I don't know, go squeeze some bugs, uh, try to find something to uh, to uh, to report on on, on, on on the Bitcoin repo. Uh, on on GitHub. I mean, it, it all depends on kind of like what what kind of person you are and um, yeah. knowing your strengths and and going for it. You know, um, what's good about Bitcoin is is, is permissionless, right? Like uh, you don't need anyone else's permission. You can just do whatever you want. Um, put that energy to use, um, and then you f- you'll figure it out if it's something for you. I mean, I see I've seen a lot of podcasts who uh, did twenty thirty episodes and then they find out maybe uh, it's not for them, but then they did something else in the Bitcoin space. I mean. Uh, I guess maybe Brady from Swan is a great example, right? Yeah. He had Citizen Bitcoin, had all the craziest guests, but then he started working for Swan and that became his mission. And, you know, look at him now, he's, he's a co-founder. Um, but he had to kind of like sacrifice the podcast in order to pursue other things. So just do whatever feels right at the moment and go with the flow. I think that's what's beautiful about Bitcoin. Like every, everybody's trying to figure it out at the same yeah. time. So, yeah. I, I always say the same. I don't know if you get messages sometimes, but I, I get people sometimes who say like, yeah, I want to contribute to Bitcoin, but what should I do? Or should I start a podcast about it in uh, Denmark or whatever? <laughs> and I always just say like, yeah, just do whatever you think you should contribute. Like it, dude, there's people who are making children's books about Bitcoin. There are people who, who make uh, wine. There are people who make certain type of... Um, you know, um, mer- um, merch like uh, like uh, fashion type thing. Like, there's people who do research uh, in media. There's people who create uh, policy. There's like a pff- whatever. I but, think the merch thing. I think maybe we should cap that. I think it's enough yeah, okay, Bitcoin maybe merch that's out done. there. So but if you're anyway, listening to you know, this, don't uh, don't get it, don't do that. <laughs> you know, um, I think his name is uh, uh, Austin Herbert. I don't know if you know him. He does like, yeah, he has like an open source uh, fitness and food protocol. <laughs> like cool. he, 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 he's a fitness guy, right? Mm-hmm. And so, that I, whatever, mm-hmm. it, it really doesn't matter. Like if you do, uh, yeah, yeah. So, well, anyway, lots I of examples. I, but I think, I think I saw yesterday like a tweet about like somebody, a woman in her 60s who are doing Bitcoin embro- embroidery. So she's fire. just like doing, yeah, embroidery. Let's go. <laughs> That's dope. Yeah, I'm still looking for like a nice Bitcoin rug. So if you know anyone who's making Bitcoin rugs, that, then that, um, hey, hit hit up. Uh, or hit, if you are a rock maker, <laughs> I mean, come on, uh, you make gotta make it. Call, call it the rug pool, right? And then boom, fire. Yeah, yeah I mean, come on. <laughs> I think I think I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna hit up Samson. He has the cypherpunk store. He made the, the green candles. I don't know if you've seen it. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He has to make the rug pool. Yeah, for sure. I'll hit him up with that Uh-oh. idea. Nice, nice. Yeah. So, what um, what are like some common counter arguments, or what's like the number one counter argument that you face or think is the most important one to uh, to de- to debunk or respond to? Oh man, objection handling in Bitcoin. There should be like a what there should be a PDF about that somewhere. Um Yeah, you know that... um what's his name? There's a guy who has like the NPC guide to Bitcoin. Do you know? <laughs> I haven't heard that's about fire. that. That's really that's fire. fucking cool. Yeah. It, it, should, it should be it should be like a 
you know, like some kind of a web-based thing where you just have a list of these fucking NPC reactions and you just hit the button and you know the answer, you know, it's, it, it's always the same thing. Um, Nolan, count BTC. Nolan, count BTC. Okay, I'll check it out. I'll check it out. A Bitcoiner's Guide to NPC Management. <laughs> you will love it. So good, so good. <laughs> it's really good. Um, no, I think... Um, I, st I do still think the environmental thing is the biggest thing that I hear the most. I think it depends on who you ask, to be honest. But if I were to like, okay, this is the one thing, I think is the environmental uh, angle. And I think, I don't think there's enough people who know about all the amazing things that people are are, are doing in Africa and, and Latin America when it comes to um, just usage of renewable energy sources uh and just like they are incentivizing an otherwise just forgotten area that they like nobody before them has managed to like to crack the code on how to go to this remote area and make it um uh, and you know, create an ecosystem um uh, that is you know all financial incentives uh, are there right and um not enough people are talking about that because you are literally making something out of nothing um, yeah. You are also taking the job that most governments uh, don't know what to do, which is what to do with surplus energy. So these people that go in, they they create uh, jobs and they create an ecosystem for the locals who have absolutely no opportunities whatsoever. And they are able to uh, use the energy that wouldn't that would otherwise be just left unused. And it's all renewable. So, you know, all of these things, if you take it to uh, some, you know, these like uh, climate hysterics um, who uh, who hate on Bitcoin because, oh, you know, you're using energy. Like to them, usage of energy by itself is a negative thing, right? Yeah. So um, you got to tell the story of like how actual use of energy and these people are providing and contributing uh, to such a beautiful thing. In, in, in desperate places, right? Like places that really need uh, 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 infrastructure. They, they need jobs. They need they need hope. And Bitcoin mining just by itself are providing all of these things for them. So yeah, I think that would be the number one, the number one thing. Nice. Um, I want to ask you the last question, mm -hmm. which is uh, the same for everyone, which is what is a core belief you will never let go? I actually think like most people are, um, they don't have time uh, to understand everything that's happening. So they they reduce the world to a very simple understanding. Like they, they look at life through a lens that makes it simple for them to survive, right? Uh, I think anyone today, if we were to look at absolutely everything and be influenced by everything, it's just too much information and we would literally go insane. Mm. Um, so I think a lot of people, myself too, me and you, we, we do this, whether it is unconscious or, 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 or not. We look at life through a lens that makes sense for us. And I think uh, you shouldn't be hard on people who are not jumping on your ideas right away. I think we need to be patient. We just need to educate. Uh, we need to just provide signal uh, everywhere we go. And I think that is the only way to change the world and change the culture or just change society for the better. So I definitely feel that's a core belief. And I try, I try to put that into the work that I do at Blogstream as well and Bitcoin Perception for that matter. Uh, so, um, yeah, I feel I feel pretty, pretty solid on, on that one. Love that. Thanks for sharing. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much for this uh, conversation. I really enjoyed it. I'll make sure that people uh, uh, can find a link to Bitcoin Perception and uh, your uh, your Twitter X account so they can follow you. And uh, yeah, man, thanks again. Thank you so much for having on. It was amazing convo. Time passed so fast. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Cheers. All right. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.